Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship at New Dublin Presbyterian Church. Once again, I don't really have an announcement to make. Does anybody else have announcements to make? Yes. Okay. This contribution is a lot of service. That's a bill for those of you who have used it in the past. Your name should be on it. If you haven't used it in the past, but would like to, just grab a box of that.
there was a star. Remember the star? Do you remember the Christmas star? And the star was noticed by three wise men. And they came a long, long, long way to come and see Jesus and gave him presents, just like we give each other presents on Christmas. They gave Jesus some presents. Because they knew who Jesus was, they knew that he was a special baby. And that's what we remember today. And it's because they took such a long time to get to Jesus, because they were so far away, uh, we, don't, we don't remember them especially until the very last day of Christmas, because we figured it took them all that time uh, to get to Bethlehem, where the baby was. But when they saw the baby, they recognized him. The fancy word epiphany, it just means, uh, it means that they had... They recognized Jesus. They didn't know who Jesus was before, but when they saw him, they uh, had an insight and recognized Jesus. And on Epiphany, we pray that we also recognize Jesus. So will you hold, hold my hand, maybe? There we go. And I'll say some words, and you say them after me. Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God, thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for giving us the story of Epiphany. Thank you for giving us the story of Epiphany. Help us recognize Jesus too. Help us recognize Jesus too. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You all can go to worship in order.
Lord, that we have the Bible as a mark of your kindness and your favor towards us. And we ask as we read this great gift of yours that you would open our hearts and minds to teach us your word and your will and cause it us to love it in you. In Christ's name. First reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 16, verses 1 to 6. Hear the word of the Lord. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense, and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. The grass withers and the flower of days, but the word of our God endures forever. The psalm this morning is from Psalm 147. And as we do, uh, this side will be unbolded, and this side will be folded. And we said you would not mind leaving this side, and I'll leave this one. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. For he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He grants peace within your borders. He fills you with the finest of wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down hail like crumbs, moving sand before his cold. He sends out his word and melts him. He makes his wind blow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and ordinances to Israel. He has not dealt with us with any other nation. They do not know his ordinances. Praise the Lord. Second reading is from Matthew. But I forgot to mark it, so I'll get to see how fast I can find it. <laughs> Reading comes from Matthew 2, verses 1 to 12. Hear the word of the Lord. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who is born King of the Jews? But we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. 
On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today, as we told the children, is the day of Epiphany, the day that we remember the coming of the wise men who brought gifts to Jesus. An Epiphany, strictly speaking, is an unveiling of a hidden divinity, but that's not usually how we use it, right? In just common parlance, if you have an Epiphany, a light dawns and now you see have insight. The problem with epiphany in the year of our Lord 2020 might be boiled down to the old saying that fish are the last ones to notice water. You can get used to anything, including, and perhaps here in the South especially, the gospel. Even the astonishing and frankly alarming confession that Jesus is Lord can lose its teeth and just become something that people say, a truism that doesn't really change anything. But Epiphany, the story that we remember on Epiphany, is full to bursting with lords and kings, and maybe despite how familiar it is, it's just what we need to knock the stones out of our ears so that we can hear that confession again in all its power. Jesus is Lord. The problem is that this story is one we're so familiar with that it's hard to really hear it. There are actually, at least here where we live, a good handful of stories like this. And they all have titles. We have Jonah and the Whale, right? And Daniel and the Lion's Den, and Elijah and the Valley of Dry Bones, this one usually is called the Three Wise Men, or the Three Kings, or the Three Magi. And stories like this, we all uh, see them, don't we, in our minds, uh, according to whatever children's Bible you have as a kid. Right? You see them in children's Bible illustration. <clears throat> this one, maybe, you see in bathrobes, little children in bathrobes with towels over their heads and cardboard crowns wrapped in gold foil. Maybe the boxes they're carrying. Those little gems that you get at the, um, at the like, Hobby Lobby, right? These images and associations are so loud that it's hard to hear the real story. What it might have meant to the first people who heard about it. To the people who saw it. It's hard to have, in other words, an epiphany when the story is this familiar. There are people, popularly, trying to make it less familiar. I bet you've heard, for instance, that you've had it pointed out to you that despite our nativity plays and Christmas carols, the scripture doesn't actually tell us how many of these people there were. We assume three because there's three gifts, but no reason for it to be three. So we have an unspecified number of what? We have lots of words, right? Three kings. Sometimes, according to the tradition you grew up in, you might even have names for these three kings. Or wise men, which is uh, what we just read, the NRC calls them wise men. And sometimes we just call them magi. The last option actually might be the best, because to call them magi is essentially just to refuse to translate the word. In the Greek of the New Testament, it's magoi, which uh, they just run through Latin to become magi, and then through English to become magi. It's just a difference uh, in pronunciation. That's probably uh, a lot of grammar, more grammar than you want on a Sunday morning. <laughs> but the point is, there's just not really an English term that really captures what a magos is. Wise is right. 
but dangerously wise, scary wise, right? Wise, we talked a lot about fairy tales last week. Wise, like that old woman or witch or whatever lives in a, uh, a cabin in a fairy tale, right? Wise and mysterious and well-educated and maybe a little bit magic. They, in they interpret signs. They show them Daniel, right? Daniel is a magos. In this case, they're astrologers. They watch the stars. This is how they see the star, right? That announces Jesus' birth. But unlike the, you know, crone who lives in a house in a fairy tale, they tend to be very wealthy. <coughs> they work for the government. Uh, they advise the king. They try to keep everything running smoothly and planned. They have warning from the stars that something is going to happen. They'll tell the king, and it'll just keep the whole kingdom running well. <coughs> So as part of their job, they've been studying the stars, and they understand what they've seen to indicate the birth of a great king. And they've come to see him, maybe ingratiate themselves a little bit. Calvin suggests that they've come to have a leg up, just in case this great king over here ends up the king of where they live, too. They brought him gifts as a kid, they'll probably live softly, right? Maybe it's helpful to think of them as slightly magical ambassadors. They might not have been kings, as we tend to think of them, but they had real political power and some superstitious power as well. So there's our first group of rulers in the story. And then, of course, there's Herod. Now, Herod is a real proper king, at least in his name. But he's not an independent king. He rules Galilee and Korea at the pleasure of the Roman Empire. And he answered to the emperor, which is not, it's not a comfortable place to be in. Not very long after these events, he's sent into exile by arguably the craziest of the Roman Empire emperors. So maybe it's understandable that when we read this story, he comes off as a little insecure. He is insecure. It's not a good place to be. I mean, it's a nice place to be king, right? But it's just uncomfortable uh, to be that close to a Roman emperor. They're just crazy. So that's the second group, or the second person. And then finally, we come to Jesus. The claim, the text, the text makes, at, I mean, the very beginning of Matthew, a bold claim about Jesus' lordship. And the story makes claims about Jesus' lordship that are obvious in some ways, but not in others. <clears throat> of course, the Magi just come straight out to Herod and guilelessly, without anxiety, ask, where's the new baby that's been born king? But what kind of king? That's not as clear. What was it about this series of events that clued Herod in to the idea that maybe his answer needed to be a little more involved than, I think there's been a mistake, I haven't had a son recently. If we had ancient ears and not modern ones, all this talk about a star would have made us hear echoes of Numbers 24, where a prof, well, his name is Balaam, he's actually also a Magos, uh, gave this blessing. He's asked to curse Israel, and he gives a blessing instead. And the blessing is this, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall arise out of Israel. It shall crush the borderlands of Moab, and the territory of all the Shephites. And when we hear this with ancient ears, we understand we're on the same page as Herod. The star that the Magi see indicates the coming, according to this, of a mighty king who is very good at winning wars, who might very well reach the far corners of the world with his armies. This is not, in other words, the puppet king of a client state of the Roman Empire. This isn't Herod. And of course, that kind of king is 
born in palaces. So it makes perfect sense all around that these wise, rich astrologers would show up at Herod's house. Where is the king? The new king, where is he? Unfortunately, it makes sense to Herod, too, and he is not happy. He is not happy. Because the arrival of this kind of king would not only threaten his own power, but it would also cause war with Rome. It would plunge the whole country into turmoil. And besides, he'd not had a son recently which meant that this great king, wherever he is, was going to usurp the throne that Herod thought of as rightly his. And in ancient times, that usually meant that his family was also in danger of being killed, all of them. Unless, unless he could wipe out this new king first. But he has to be careful, right? Because these wealthy, powerful, maybe somewhat magical men standing in front of him who are instantly faced with the same threat are obviously very invested in meeting and honoring this new king, not killing him. So he engages in a bit of political politicking. When he finds this king, he tells the night guy, tell me too, I want to honor him as well. And he's lying. We know he's lying. We talked about it last week. When the Magi are warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, and Herod figures out that his plan has failed, he just goes nuts and kills every baby who's approximately the right age in Bethlehem. Herod will do anything to keep a white knuckle grip on power. Fortunately, the Magi don't listen. They're not caught up in this anxiety of Herod's that this king might somehow threaten their power. They go, they find baby Jesus, and honor him with gifts fit for a king, and then go home another way to avoid the increasingly anxious Herod. Herod was right to be worried. The book of Matthew opens with a strong claim about who Jesus is, the Messiah, the son of David, the rightful king of Israel and continues to unpack that claim with this story of the wise men and Herod. Nobody in the story knows exactly who Jesus is. They all think that he's going to grow up to be a force to be reckoned with, the great political leader, the great commander of armies. They react to this in different ways, the Magi by coming to honor him, Herod by trying to kill him, but they agree on that. But the truth is bigger than any of them know. Jesus is Lord. We like to quote Jesus as saying that his kingdom is not of this world. And I think we like to do it because it comes across to us as a soothing, comforting thing. Jesus' authority is just spiritual. There's nothing political about it. The obedience that we owe Jesus is fulfilled by our prayers and our private devotional time and by supporting the local food bank. And I'm not minimizing these things. Private devotion is important and care for the poor is vital and all of these things are integral parts of what it means to follow Jesus. But if that's the kind of authority we think Jesus has, we're thinking too small. We're making the same mistake that Herod made, the same mistake that the wise men might also have made, though without the same tragic consequences, I hope. Jesus is Lord, and he is Lord absolutely, over the physical as well as the spiritual, over the political as well as the private or individual. <clears throat> the authority of Jesus Christ relativizes the claim of all other authorities, which means that every king or parliament or president or government or parent or administrator can only exercise authority insofar as they participate in Christ's authority and work according to his will and command. They can only be obeyed insofar as they can be obeyed for Christ's as part of our obedience to Christ, we respect those that he has put in authority over us, but it can never be unconditional respect. It 
must always become void the moment those authorities depart from the will of our true king, who alone holds complete dominion over everything. Every ward on earth must sooner or later bow before the Lord Jesus Christ, whether they come with gifts like the Magi or with white knuckled anxiety to inherit. When we were baptized, we were baptized into the kingdom of heaven, which is the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sooner or later, we know that every knee will bow and every tongue confess, but for us, that decisive moment is now. For us, there is no real king but Jesus Christ, no real authority but his authority, no true obedience except the obedience we offer him. And when we take communion, as we will do here in a few moments, we renew our oaths of citizenship in that kingdom. Seal once again the covenant that binds us to our Lord. And we are offered new grace and strength, new food for the journey of faith. So, this epiphany, let us do this with joy, and with renewed recognition who the baby born in Bethlehem is. And may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip us with every good that we may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Christ, and let us confess our faith in the words of the Holy Spirit. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally
for all the many gifts God has given to us, let us return to the Lord the tithes and offerings of our life. Children and heirs, 
By him alone we have access to your favor, freely shown. By him alone we are raised into your spiritual kingdom, there to eat and drink with you and the Son at that most joyful table of eternal life. In the present time, we on earth have communion with you in heaven. But in the time to come, we shall be raised to that endless joy prepared for us before the foundation of the world is laid. God of all mercy, we pray that by your Spirit you would set apart this bread and this cup so that we may receive by faith the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ as you have commanded. And so feed on him that he may be one with us and us with him, who has loved us and given himself up for us. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now, with the boldness of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of God.
mouth of faith, this is the body of Christ, the bread of God.
Go out into the world in peace. Love and serve the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his